everyone, my name is Komal and I am going to be moderating the panel today. Um, I am calling in from San Diego, California. So it is about early afternoon for me out here, um, but so glad you all were able to join. So today's panel is called Pedagogies of Care and I'm going to just share a short description of kind of the essence of what we want today's session to be based on. So it reads, butterflies are not only extremely elegant and beautiful, they also serve important roles in the ecosystems that they are a part of. Perhaps most significantly pollinating important food crops and flowers. Over the past four decades, butterfly populations have been decreasing, with many species, including the monarch, inching closer to extinction. As with the butterfly, many other of our sacred species, traditions, languages, cultures, etc., are going extinct. In these talks, we will hear from individuals and groups that are working to re and live in, reconnect, and re engage through acts of education. Although these projects will be shared individually, they are part of a larger distributed global movement. Each of these actions are significant with impacts and effects far beyond. These talks are organized to connect, share, inspire, and spread these butterfly effects wider for the sake of revitalizing our human and non-human ecosystems. So here we are. Um, we have four panelists today and we're going to go ahead and get started with our first one. So it is my pleasure to introduce Yelena Vasic and I'm going to read her quick bio, um, which states she is an educator, independent, interdisciplinary scholar practitioner, dancer and movement facilitator. She's currently conducting an independent research project, Metamorphosis Through Movement, which explores the transformative power of dance. I'm going to put her link in the chat for anyone who wants to see further. And Yelena, it's all you. You wanna unmute yourself? There you go. <laughs> I always do that. Thank you for reminding me. Thank you so much for uh, being here. Um, I just want to say that I'm very excited to share this work with you. And um, um, I just want to first just acknowledge everyone's presence here. And um, to ask you, how are you doing? How's everyone doing? It's been a long day, sleepy. Okay. How's your body feeling? Yeah, <laughs> sleepy, okay, all right. So um, there's a lot that I can say about this and uh, I, because I'm so passionate about it, but instead of telling you uh, about the work that I do, uh, the best way to share this work is to actually have you experience it yourself. So we are going to be moving. Before we start moving, there are a couple of things that I would, <laughs> Not if you don't feel like moving, that's fine. And don't worry, it's going to be gentle. Uh, you go at your own pace. Um, and this whole practice is learning to listen to your body. Um, so a couple of things before we begin. Um, if you, just a reminder that this is being recorded, if you know that you're gonna feel self-conscious about dancing in front of a camera, uh, turn it off. I would love to have everyone, uh, you know, being able to see everyone because that's kind of how I lead through the body dialogue, but uh, I completely understand it's a very vulnerable position to be in. So uh, I'd rather that you feel comfortable with movement. Um, I will also be sharing uh, music on my end, just a way to track the time. Um, so if just a reminder for everyone, and I think everyone has their mics muted. Um, and um, if you could, last thing, two things, uh, grab something to write or draw with, and also clear the space. Clear the space so you don't knock anything that's fragile or you don't hurt yourself. And as I said, this is just, taking the pulse of how we're feeling and especially giving our body and, and uh, mind a break from screen time. 
Are there any questions before we begin? No? Okay. So I will invite you to um, stand up. And if you're wearing socks, you can take them off just to feel, sense the, the floor underneath you. But if that's not possible, just make sure that your feet are comfortable. That was my speaker, just so you know. Oh, and my music is over there. So, stand comfortably. Hip width apart. Your feet are hip width apart. And just taking a breath. And before we start moving, I would invite you to just um, start looking around your space. So orienting yourself to where you are right now. So slowly just looking around your space, sensing the environment around you. And then bringing the gaze down towards your feet. And then becoming aware of the ground a little bit more. Sending the awareness to the feet and the sensation, the contact between the skin and the ground underneath. I invite you to, if you feel comfortable, you can close your eyes and that just allows us to tap into the sensation a little bit more. If that's not an option, you can just keep your gaze lower. And then start bringing your hands and just squeezing your body, starting with your hands and just moving towards your shoulders. And this can be really gentle or if you need a little bit more uh, stronger massage, you can start massaging. And if you can slow down the movement. And if the mind has you know, feels a little bit like it wants to rush. Honor that, but keep on moving slowly. Yeah. And let's start doing the same thing, traveling down our legs towards the ground, squeezing the legs. Make sure that you squeeze your feet around your toes, just really sensing the solid structure of your bones and the muscles, and then moving up at the back of your legs. And then massaging the back, the buttocks, the back. Beautiful. Good. Now, keeping your eyes either closed or just with your gaze in front of you, start shifting your weight from your toes to your heels. So very gently. And then perhaps moving your weight from side to side. So noticing the shift of balance, gravity, and then moving in circle like a pendulum, trying to find the perfect center. Sensing where you feel most grounded, more balanced. Now very gently start pushing down into the earth activating your muscles and making your muscles and legs more solid, giving your body a little bit more structure here. And then really tensing your arms, bringing your fingertips in, making it into fist and really, really tensing everything. And then exhale, soften. 
And then let's invite a little bit of water fluid motion into our body. So start still with your feet connected to the ground. Start making your whole body move like a wave. Starting with the feet, moving up the legs, and then up the spine. And we're gonna move through all the joints in our body, making circular motion around the joints, inviting a little bit of synovial fluid in our body. So starting with the jaw, so making uh, opening and closing your jaw. And then bringing your neck into this movement. And once again, reminder is to keep it slow for now. No need to rush. I always say the slower you move, the more you can feel. And if you feel like you're rushing, slow down. And if you feel if you are moving slowly, move slower. So let's bring in, bring in our shoulders, our elbows, our wrists. Imagine that you are standing in underneath the waterfall and you're trying to distribute water to all parts of your body, like a container. So your body is like a container and you're trying to distribute water by moving. So let's bring in our spine and then our pelvis. And you can make this movement in any direction your body feels like moving. So it can be circles, it can be number eight. And let's bring that water down the spine, down the pelvis, into our knees. And if you feel like you want to move through the space, please do so. Honor what your body is called to do. Now let's bring that circular movement into our wrists and ankles. The rest of the body is still moving fluidly. Really giving our body a little bit of a break of sitting in front of the screen the whole day. Now let's begin to make this a little bit bigger movement. So inviting a little bit of bigger flow. So imagine maybe you are in the ocean and you start making waves with your body. Feet are still connected to the earth. And slowing down that, slowing down the movement. Making it smaller and smaller. Now bringing awareness back to the contact with the earth. Still breathing. Really plug your feet into the ground. And then what we're gonna do is we're just gonna start shaking our legs. And this, what you wanna do is make this movement first gentle, but then bring a little bit more heat into the body by bringing the energy up through your legs until the rest of the body starts shaking. And instead of trying to 
rush and push movement to come. Let the movement cut through the body on its own. Shaking your hands, your shoulders. If you feel like jumping, making any sound, sound effects. Woo! Just invite in a little bit more heat and see where this plane takes you. Don't stop until you feel a little bit more fire energy in your body. We're gonna start counting and I invite you to progressively start shaking faster. And I'm just gonna do it for five, four, three, two, and one. Relax. Allow your hands to just drop by your side. Still keep on breathing. Now let's invite a little bit of air element in our movement and in our body. So by starting to move your hands like two feathers or two wings, in bringing that light quality of air into your body. So very different than the earth. An element of air likes to move. So move around your space and perhaps start looking at your hands as they move. So now your awareness is at your hands, palms, fingertips, And then see whether or not you can sense and feel the air on your skin as you move. You might need to slow down the movement in order to feel that. Keep on breathing. Now let's open our hands to expand, open, 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 and exhale to contract, bringing our hands towards the center. Let's do this two more times. Inhale, opening the chest, opening the heart, exhale to round. Last time like this, like two wings. Exhale. Now this last time, you're gonna start bringing your hands towards your body really slowly. Bringing your awareness, your attention to the hands, palms, sensation, until your hands land on your heart center, one hand on top of another. And start really feeling your heartbeat. Now, if you feel like moving, please do so. If you feel called to stop, you can do that as well. But paying attention to the rhythm of your heart. And now bringing awareness to the sound of your breath. If you're moving, start bringing your body to stillness. 
So the only thing that's moving is the breath. I mean, everything in the body is moving, but from the physical, from, from the outside, you're still. Now bow your head towards your heart. Breathing in and breathing out. Gently, if your eyes are closed, gently open them, looking at the floor, grounding. And without talking, just slowly with awareness, start walking towards your writing or drawing material. And just for one minute, just for the sake of time, um, I would invite you to either draw or just reflect, write whatever comes through. Okay. And then we'll get ready for the next presenter just to see whichever one has time. Okay. That was beautiful. Wow. What a way to start the <laughs> start today's panel. So thank you so much, Yelena. That was beautiful. Um, all right, so I am going to share next um, a little bit about me. I'm an educational consultant and recently published author of a book called Raise Your Hand. And um, my background is I was a um, middle school math teacher for five years and then went to business school and I'm now here. So a lot of what I'm sharing today is in the context of the K through 12 school system because that's really where my experience lies. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. And one second. All right. Okay. Thumbs up if you can see that. We're good to go. Awesome. All right, so thanks for being here today. Um, my presentation is Raising Our Hands for Consciousness. And this is a quote that resonates with me deeply, which is joy does not simply happen to us. We have to choose joy and keep choosing it every day. And I know that as I've gotten older, this has been something that resonates with me more, finding joy in the little moments, when I look out into nature, being with loved ones. Um, but I was really lucky because growing up, I really knew what joy felt like. And that was because you could always find me on a stage. So I feel this is very timely after Yelena's presentation because since the age of four, I was dancing. I was always dancing at every wedding and um, every Indian function that you can find. I trained classically for seven years and when I was on stage, I felt alive. I felt that the whole world would dissipate and I was able to perform and creatively express myself in a way that I didn't always feel when I got off the stage. Because a lot of times when I was off the stage, I was in school. And when I was in school, I went to a school where every day, I would walk into a classroom and go to my assigned seat, open my backpack, take out my notebook, my pencil for the day, sit quietly and look at the teacher in front of me for the lesson of the day. 
And there were all these rules. Raise your hand. Don't speak without permission. Line up straight. Did you ask your teacher? Did you ask your parents? Are you sure you're allowed to do this? And so for so long, I felt that I was in a place where the spotlight was not on me anymore. It was someone else's stage and it wasn't mine. And I just feel that every kid <laughs> deserves the type of joy that they may feel in other parts of their lives, also in their learning and in their schooling. And one of the biggest things is our inner selves. And so this is my big call, which is to raise our collective hands to bring more joy and more consciousness into our current school system. And a lot of my perspective is from the United States because that's where I currently reside. And creating a system that actually cultivates the inner self of a child and who they truly are. And I think a lot about the stats that we see most recently, which is that one in six children are diagnosed with a mental health illness, 1.2 million students drop out of high school in the US every year, and 29% of students experience student apathy. So the question becomes, is it the kids or is it the system? Because if the system is failing so many of these kids from who they truly are, then is it working? And this is where the mind-body-spirit connection comes in. I think a lot of people can argue that the mind is cultivated in school with our intellect and our learning. Our bodies, a lot of us maybe had phys ed or had to move our bodies in school in certain ways. But when it came to that inner self, that spirit within us, and the joy that we felt, our intuition, our energies, a lot of that was not cultivated in our schooling system, even though that's a big part of who we are. And so I think about this framework, um, which is con conscious connected contribution. And ultimately the idea is that we bring more consciousness in our humanity by first looking at ourselves really deeply and understanding ourselves, our inner selves. Because when we do that, we're able to connect more deeply with the people around us and our surroundings and ultimately contribute to the universe or humanity as a whole in some positive and uplifting way. And this is something that I say a lot, which is systems are made up of people. If we want a system to change, people have to change first. And a lot of times what I've seen in education is that we get the frameworks, we get the pedagogy, but we are still the same human being. And it takes a lot of internal work to be able to do this work in a conscious way. So first we have to really deeply look at ourselves and really try to become conscious of many different things. And one of the first thing that is, and going to stakeholders here, you know, this is parents, school leaders, teachers, it's kind of every adult in the system going, are we here for the child? Are we here for their joy? And what does that actually look like? And what does that actually mean to not make a school become about who they become, but who they are right now? And what does that actually look like? And it starts with us, right? Um, unlearning is a big part of that. It's asking ourselves difficult questions, like what was my schooling like growing up? How was success message to me? Is that what success looks like to me now? Is that what success looks like for my child? Is this system resonating with my child? And if not, why? And it's asking ourselves those difficult questions, which can be hard because a lot of times we had to take pride in our own education um, and we identify with it, including myself. And so it's hard to question something that has brought us to who we are today. But the question is just because something is good now does not mean it cannot become better for the future generations. The next thing to ask ourselves is how to really be authentic to who we are. As children, a lot of times we give up being true to who we are in order to belong, in order to be validated and accepted by our parents and our teachers. We wanna be loved. And so we kind of put on a mask so we can be accepted by the world. So what does it mean to deconstruct that and become authentic to who we truly are in our truth? And this also means there's a lot of healing involved. It's really looking deeply at our past and our experiences in order to heal and move forward. 
So the reason I mention all of this is because when we're trying to transform a system of schooling, for example, for our children, it cannot happen until we're doing this individual work ourselves and becoming conscious of who we are. Because I truly believe that every child <laughs> deserves an education that makes them feel like this that makes them feel joyful and excited and they feel connected to who they deeply are and they feel empowered because life is going to have its ups and downs but they are equipped with their own understanding of themselves and conscious so that way they can contribute to the world in a positive way. And I speak a lot about this in my book. And so if you're interested about consciousness and education, I had the privilege of speaking with 70 educators all over the world about what it means to be conscious in our educational system. Um, and so I talk deeply about my childhood, my schooling, and kind of how I've evolved that over time. And I'll end with this. This is a Nelson Mandela quote, there can be no keener revelation of a society's soul than the way in which it treats its children. And so if we do this, if we become conscious of who we are and connected, then maybe our children in the next generation can grow up to who they want to be, not who we want them to become. Thank you so much. All right, um, I will put a link in the chat, but we're gonna go ahead and move on. Thank you so much for listening to my presentation. Um, we are going to, I believe, Steve, are you next? Um, I can go next if you want me to go next. Okay, is that okay, Juliana? Okay, sounds good. Um, <laughs> all right, we're gonna just move on through. So um, I'm, have the pleasure of introducing Steve England. He is coming out of Wales, England um, and joining us today. And he is a founder and trainer, The Art of Sustainability. Uh, he has a few links that I'll also pop in the chat for all of you, but Steve, take it away. Thank you very much. I'm going to be sharing my screen. So I'm hoping this is gonna come up. Can people see that? Hello. Yes, yes, we can. We can. Okay. I put a, I put a, a uh, I can't see you anymore, so I'm not sure why, but uh, I'll just go on with it. I put a link into the chat because um, I'm running this off my computer. So um, if, you, if it, there may be lag or, or whatever, but um, if you can't see it, maybe you can run it off, off, the, uh, off the link. So um, yeah, so let's start. So as I say, um, I'm, I'm, thank you for that introduction. I'm Stephen England from the Art of Sustainability. We, uh, we are, uh, the Art of Sustainability is a, as a collaborative social enterprise um, working in the field of uh, sustainability. Um, and uh, I won't go into mo too much further. You can go to the website and get more detail about that if you want. Um, so yeah, so essentially we're working within the framework of sustainability. Um, and uh, the, the areas we work in are around systems and behavioral change. And my particular area is concerned with behavioral change. Um, as said before, you know, it's not going to be the system that changes things, it's going to be the people that changes things. And that's going to require us to uh, think and act differently. I'm based in Wales. Um, and in 2015, the Welsh government uh, passed the legislation making sustainability the central organizing principle of government. And that works its way throughout the whole of, of the education system, right, right, right down to the education system. So at the side of the uh, of the uh, SDGs, those are the, the, the little um, icons, you can see that Wales has uh, goals as well, which uh, basically uh, connect interconnect with um, with the SD with the uh, with the SDGs with the uh, international goals. So there's the Welsh goals and the international goals, and the and the legislation is called. Um, well-being future generations um, and so this question of well-being is uh, is the deliverable of sustainability in Wales um, now it, the, the conversation around well-being tends to be dominated by the um, by the uh, the question of health that tends to be what dominates the question of what well-being is and SDG3 um, concerns with uh, health and well-being but I, I think 
um, where, where, where there's a deeper, profounder question at work. Um, um, and if, if, if we are um, trying to make uh, being well, then we need to go deeper than just health. Um, health is important, of course it is. But it's it's when we're um, it's very often when our health is 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 in some kind of jeopardy. We suddenly become aware of this amazing thing that's going on around us, and 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 it becomes so precious. Our time, our um, our experience becomes precious. But most of the time, it's kind of just hid, hidden behind um, things to do and stresses and problems and worries and concerns and deadlines and and all kinds of things. So we need a way of of getting at being. And and um, and that means we've got to find a way of of putting all these uh, challenges and concerns and worries and um, all the things we deal with uh, to one side. So the research that I've been working on is uh, in the wellness of being is is based around phenomenological and um, arts based research um, in terms of how can we do that? How can we get at being um, and and um, and check it and, and check in on that and, and, and move into that deep, profounder space um, that I, I think um, well, a lot of people are asking themselves, you know, we have, a, we, we have more material wealth and more um, a time, a life expectancy than ever before, but still this question persists. So there must be something we're, we're asking ourselves, which we're not getting in, in, in mainstream um, education. Um, so how do we do that? Well, we can use uh, me methodologies, techniques within meditation and mindfulness to kind of do that. And, uh, and we use six within the, within the uh, wellness of being. Uh, permissioning, just giving yourself permission to meditate uh, for many people can be a challenge. Um, they've got lots to do and fi taking five minutes out of your life just to, med to meditate can be difficult. Concentrating, our concentration span is, span is reducing. Um, ever, ever more, um, so that's becoming more difficult. Returning, returning to our meditation, returning to our concentration, returning to the breath, if that's your point of concentration. Um, that's going to take time, building up the experience, building up the knowledge. Um, that requires patience, it requires gentleness with yourself. Um, some days will be better than others. Enjoying, if you don't enjoy your meditation, you're not likely to return to it. Um, so um, that's important, but also within that is the idea of um, the quality of your experience. The, how, if we're talking about being, we're talking about experience. We're talking about the quality of experience. You know, we're not talking about a quantitative change. We're talking about a qualitative change. And those challenge questions within within uh, within the whole um, well-being movement about how do you measure that? How do you measure well-being? How do we know, how do we baseline that? And how do we know um, we're delivering on well-being? And finally, there's uh, letting go, just letting go of what we think meditation is or letting go of what we, um, any agendas we may uh, take into meditation and just dealing with whatever is. Um, and this is, um, and, it, and we don't just live in our heads. We, uh, we belong to a web of, of interconnectedness and interdependency. Um, and here in the, the temperate zone of, of, of the planet, we experience the seasons. So um, this is uh, something we do in nature, we do outside, we connect with the natural world. We use these um, activities in terms of being connected to, to nature um, and, and being part of the seasons as the sun journeys through the seasons. But there's, a, there's, a, there's also an educational aspect of this, which is important in terms of the way that we engage with, with sustainability or education for sustainability and global citizenship or ESDGC, which is like the, the academic speak for sustainability. We tend to engage with the challenges of sustainability as problems, which tend to um, take us into our amygdala and release lots of cortisol. Um, and, um, and, and this results in trauma. And one of the things um, you, we are, we're, when we're engaging in the challenges of sustainability is we're, we're entering into trauma, um, things like climate change and poverty and, and um, a lot of the challenges that, that sustainability is dealing with are asking us to engage with trauma. So we need to have a way of engaging with these challenges, uh, do the work, but maintain our own well-being. Um, and to do that, we can use the, these techniques, these meditation techniques, mindfulness techniques, to move from the amygdala into the hippocampus um, that, that allows for uh, creative thinking, uh, systems thinking, 
free thinking, um, future thinking. And it allows us to engage with these questions as potential uh, rather than problems. And that opens up a, a different answer, it gives you a different response and releases good chemistry like dopamine. And so what we have is a, a, as a sort of a blending of, of um, pedagogy, therapy and uh, biophilia in terms of getting at well-being um, and using um, and, and bringing well-being uh, to ourselves and, and to the natural world. Um, so there's a tremendous amount there, um, and um, a lot of um, a lot of um, brain power used up. Um, so what we're going to do is, rather than uh, talk about it, I just think um, I just invite you to experience it, uh, rather than uh, uh, go on. So maybe we can just do a, a short uh, meditation, just like a one minute at the end of this. We're watching the river passing us by. Um, this is the River Y. It's my local river. It's literally just down the road from me. Um, I use film and video. Um, if people can't enter into natural spaces, um, I use film and video and multimedia as a way of bringing those spaces into uh, and into um, uh, into this space, um, the online space. So maybe um, working on developing onto that lovely work we did at the beginning. Maybe we can just return to that space of stillness and calm. Maybe we can just return to the breath. Just take a moment. Stay with the breath. Thank you. Thank you so much, Steve. Appreciate you. All right, uh, we are moving on to our last but not least presenter. Um, this is Juliana Machado. Um, yay, I got it right. Uh, <laughs> and she is calling in from Brazil. So we're so happy to have you here. Um, a little bit about her. She is an architect and psychoanalyst and has been dedicating her time to education since 2002. She combines psychic, constructions with cognitive processes and helps people to become masters of their learning process. So I will put some links in the chat and Juliana, you can go for it. Thank you, Samuel. thank you very much. Um, I'm so happy to be here with you all. Um, I would like to acknowledge your hearts being here, your presence. Um, I, I need to uh, make a little bit of disclaimer. I'm just recovering from COVID and I'm, I still have a COVID brain. So if I sometimes forget, so yeah, I feel so relieved to say that. I feel that I, I'm in a safe environment. So that's that's all about maybe what I'm going to share with you. So um, I don't have like a presentation. I would just like to share my story from my heart with you all. And my story is the following. I have always been a straight A student when I was a child. Uh, I imagine that some of you can resonate with that. And when I came out of school, um, I went to the university. And when I came out, I realized that I was lost. I was completely lost because I, I didn't know what to do. I always uh, had this question, hey, somebody tell me what to do. Tell me what to do. Because that's all that I've been doing through all my life, like accomplishing external demands, assignments, and tasks. And, and works that I was supposed to do and writing essays and so on and so forth. Um, and then that made me realize that I was kind of living as a parasite, 
like I didn't know my my boundaries. I was just craving for someone to tell me what to do. And I was so I I was I felt weak and I felt like I didn't have ability to live my own life. So that's, that was when um, the suffering in myself got so bad that I needed to um, ask for help. And that's when my life meets psychoanalysis. Um, my motivation was completely gone. And I, I realized that I was being guided in life by a clock, like a tick of a clock, time, one thing, like a linear sequence of events. And I have completely lost track of my inner compass. So psychoanalysis like helped me jump within and regain that inner compass. And that's that when it clicked me, hey, that inner compass is all about the questions that have never been answered in my life. It's all about the, my curiosity being boxed through all my scholar, my, my school years. So, but, but I still have this with me. I still have loads of questions. I still have an immense curiosity to fulfill. And then that's what I, when I came across self-directed learning. And, and that's why for me, learning was a huge part of my healing process. Because um, when I started to, answer to this inner questions and, and, and following my own curiosity, I regain like, like uh, the ground of my life. And I started to feel something that I have lost, which was the sense of agency. So for me, when I started like, hey, I am, I am the one who who lives my life. I am, I am the, the, the main character of the story that I'm writing. So I might as well write the story based upon what is important to me. And then uh, I've been a teacher for more than 20 years. I started asking my students when there was chaos in the class, I just sat down, looked them in the eyes and asked, what is important to you right now? What what do you need to be happening that is not happening? And this completely changed the way that kids and me relate to each other because we had um, like a night to eye type of type of um, relationship. Um, so instead of instead of um, feeling I, I can do this, oh my God, I'm desperate. I started to say, hey, no matter what, no matter what's going on, I can do this. I, I can learn how to do this. So I started to uh, gather my inner resources to have resource to have like ways to deal with reality. So I learned to be responsive and not reactive. And then I wanted the same for the students that I work with. So I started to just um, mind the, the most important thing for me when I was with them is to like what. What do you need? What's important to you right now? And um, and that was when I had a dream that I would love to share with you. So I had a dream that I was running, 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 and it was a huge dog like chasing me. And I was like, hey, I'm gonna die. I'm gonna die. I can't escape from this dog. I'm gonna die. And then suddenly I stopped and I turn around and I put my hands on his mouth, on his like big, uh, big uh, fangs. And then they just say, hey, you're not gonna hurt me. And suddenly I felt super, so yeah, I can deal with this, with my inner strength. And then I took that to my therapy. And she said to me, hey, Juliana, have you ever seen the tarot card of strength? And here I have it. And I would love to share with you. Take a look. I was simply amazed because, yeah, I, I just found the inner strength in me through learning how to deal with life. So it's not about, ah, this is easy, I know it all, but I have now um, gathered this, I can learn. I, I don't need to know it all, but I can learn how to deal. Um, yeah, so 
So basically, that's what I do with my work today with the ELC that I have here in Brazil. It's an agile learning center based on self-directed learning and also the um, Enroll Yourself Learning Marathon that I, that I host here. It's all about helping people remember. Remember that you're curious and you have yeah, you have inner resources to deal and your agents of your own, of our own life. Yeah, so that would be me. Um, yeah, and thank you for listening to my story. Thank you, Juliana. That was beautiful and amazing to hear. And it was all from your heart. <laughs> which was even more beautiful. Um, well, thank you to all the panelists. We're gonna move into Q&A. So um, we have the time now, feel free to just unmute and ask anyone or even the collective any questions you may have. And you can also drop it in the chat, but we would love to hear your voice. So feel free to unmute and ask any questions that are coming up for you. Um, I'm, I'm hearing a common theme through all the presentations, which has to do with what can be the, you know, the dollar fifty word is perception of self-efficacy. When when a learner feels like the the jaws of the chasing dog are uh, friendly and not non-threatening, then they can both learn without fear and perform. So we've heard about dancing, we've heard about meditation, we've heard about dreams. Um, and I, I'm, I'm thinking of the picture, I think that, um, that Kamal had of the, the small child laughing wonderfully. Um, ba most babies don't have a problem with perception and self-efficacy. They, they are, we're born um, exploring, reaching out, uh, knowing how to learn, most of us. I mean, there are, I'm not saying everybody, I, I don't like the superlative descriptions. Um, and what, what we see as adults is, is a huge percentage of the population that's had that, that innate instinct quashed, taken away from us. Um, and, and in, in uh, Kamal's description, she talked about dancing, but it's high, and it's highly trained dancing. So I, 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 I'm thinking about that it's not the training and the schooling and the discipline that's the problem. It's whether the learner chooses that or not that makes the problem. So if, if one wants to become if one's intrinsically motivated to become an expert dancer or an expert mathematician or an expert ecologist uh, or anything, it has an entire, you, you develop the discipline, the theory, all the pieces that you need, but it comes from inside you instead of having some teacher or other authority say, okay, now it's time for you to master X, Y, Z. And then, a lot of the, the educational literature today is about how to motivate students. If instead we say how to uncover, unearth the student's um, intrinsic motivation, and then how do we nurture that? Um, we don't know what a population would be like um, in, in the modern domesticated world as compared with the more, the wilder indigenous world. Um, I mean, I think we could look to find some, ex some people that have that kind of experience, but it's pretty rare. And we're doing a wonderful job at, um, at extinguishing that with our educational system. So, so I'm, I'm, I'm speaking in favor of discipline and training, but in a different kind of context, in a context where the learner chooses it rather than when um, it's imposed on the learner. Liza, can I add on to what you said? First of all, just so much resonated. The minute you said the unearth, I was like, oh, 
everything that I feel all of us want <laughs> to say about, you know, I always say our system disconnects us from who we truly are. We're already connected when we're born. And then over time, we just get disconnected. And now we're as adults, we're unlearning <laughs> all these things to find our you know, our movement and our body and our mind and meditation and all of these things, you know, but it's interesting too, because sometimes what I've learned, especially being a teacher is even when that's the intention, like we want the self-efficacy for the kid, we want them to have choice, but sometimes we don't realize we're getting in our own way. You know, I've always had to check my own like language with kids, because even if I wanted them to be that, the minute that I'm saying, I'm so proud of you or good job, then the validation is me again, you know? And so it's like, how do I make them see for themselves of what they already have and feeling that reaction? Because sometimes the dynamic that I see a lot of times becomes a power structure unconsciously. We don't even realize we're doing it, but it becomes about permission always. You've got to ask permission. Um, and yes, to Juliana's point, it's taken me a long time to not <laughs> do permission anymore. I do me and like live from within, but it's taken a lot of work. It's not easy um, to do that. But um, I just had to share that based on what you said, because just a lot of what you said really resonated. So thanks for sharing, but anyone can chime in. <laughs> put a book in the in the chat that I really like. So one of the um, things I'd like to share is around play. Um, children play instinctively. You don't have to ask a child to play. But adults um, need to know why they're playing. Um, and this is one of the reasons why I um, talk about it's, it's useful, I found, for adults to kind of lift the head on the, the hood on the head and say, okay, this is what's happening in your brain, and this is why you're doing what you're doing. Um, this is why we're, we're trying to move away from the, the amygdala into the hippocampus and, and explain that, because it's very difficult to get adults to play um, and to just do silly things or be creative, um, <clears throat> unless they know why they're going to do it. Um, so that was uh, that 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 uh, that helps. And I, I've worked with engineers, and I've taught engineers and science people, and all the rest of them. And they're incredibly difficult to um, to get to play, even though what they do is incredibly creative um, and and requires creativity. Um, there's there's something in the education system which kind of strips that away as part of the process. And um, you know, I, I I can cite Einstein who who loved to play and came up with fantastic new ideas about the universe but there's something in the education system which says mm, no no value in this um so i, I just want to share that essentially uh, i i find it useful to explain why we're doing what we're doing um and then i kind of get a better um, engagement than just saying well let's do something silly so i just wanted to put that out there Do we have time for me to add on to what Stephen just said? Or Steve? Yeah, please do. Yeah, okay. If ever, anyone needs to go, I completely understand. But um, I 100% agree with what everyone was sharing. Uh, I The reason why I started uh, bringing movement into my classroom, just to give you a context, I used to teach at University of Toronto where uh, while I was teaching there, there was um, a huge problem with men mental health issues. And we had, we started having a lot of um, sadly suicides on campus where university didn't talk about. Um, and I found myself in between uh, administration and my students trying to bridge the two um, because I've seen what, what was happening in the classroom and I tried to bring that into, I mean, there's so much theory behind the practice that I could you know, go into uh, from somatic experiencing and trauma storing the body um, and, and, and the movement and you know, the uh, creativity 
I had students uh, cry in my class um, because they're an artist, but they're being uh, pushed by their parents to become engineers. And, and um, so my way of kind of, and I left the university because I was, tr I was tired of fighting the system. Um, and something that Stephen also mentioned is my work needs to be more with the uh, educators because something that what you said, it's, it's changing the way we act and the way we think. And a lot of times when I show up uh, and uh, I start dancing, um, it's not taken seriously. It's not academic enough. Uh, and, uh, and also, you know, being in the body is not, especially in academia, it's, um, it's secondary. It's, um, so I think my way of contributing is to bringing body back into uh, the classrooms and, 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 and integrating the mind and the body instead of separating. Um, so that's where kind of my, you know, Eastern and Western background kind of meets. Uh, and it's been, it's been challenging. It's been really challenging to, uh, to do that in, in a system like a university. Um, so yeah, it's, but I'm not giving up. So thank you. <laughs> I just want to say really quickly that although I was in various stages of consciousness during all of these, they were all really, really good presentations and I really appreciated them. Thank you. Thank you.